How you all doing? Hope you well. I'm with Dr. Shan. How are you again, my friend? Doing good. How great are you? Great to see you. Look, look, survived the Christmas. Oh, yes, and it was the, great. <laughs> and the New Year. I put on a bit of weight over Christmas, and I'm, I'm now getting it back off. It's a bit more, but I went. I didn't completely strictly primal over Christmas. I will confess, there is a time sometimes where you just. <laughs> Anyway, I'm back on it, feel great. So uh, let's get straight on with Ask the Doctor questions. Uh, please, can you recommend some good supplements to take for me as I suffer with rheumatoid arthritis? I'm a 57 year old female. This is Claire, not me. Uh, <laughs> I look forward to hearing from you soon. Yours sincerely, sorry, not Claire, Carrie. So Carrie wants to know what supplements could she take um, for rheumatoid arthritis? Okay, yeah, a, a terrific question Carrie. I think um, obviously it's important to look at and ensure we're getting good quality nutrients within our diets and focusing on whole foods and, and uh, the low carb foods that you and I already talk about. But in addition to that, looking at supplementation, one of the uh, things with rheumatoid arthritis and many of the treatments that a start of it is that it can actually lower our folic acid levels, our folate levels within our body. I never knew that. So okay. it's important to supplement that yep. and make sure that we're getting a uh, healthy good amounts of folic acid yeah. and oftentimes doctors actually prescribe it for you but if not if you're looking for supplementation for that then obviously do uh, do address that. Um, gut health is also a very key part of it uh, so supporting your gut health wherever you can through looking at dietary measures, intermittent fasting as we've talked about many yeah. times which is which is a brilliant uh, approach to taking care of not only gut health but also our overall well-being and our metabolism. Um, and, and I think uh, gut health is important because this is an immune yes. problem. In, 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 if, we, if we want to put it in sort of a box, it's kind mm. of an immune problem, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so increasingly so many autoimmune conditions seem yeah. to be arising from gut health yeah. uh, and it's important we do what we can to su support and promote our gut health. So taking probiotics may also be of benefit in these situations as well. Get your diet right, get your gut sorted out so it might be Greek yogurts, mm -hmm. uh, especially natural Greek yogurts, because we know those are good for the gut. Uh, let's think other things. Uh, it could be uh, kefir, it could be it's a, it could be uh, pickled uh, vegetables, like the good mm -hmm. old days, like our grandmas used to mm -hmm. do the pickled vegetables and and, and 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 cauliflowers and so on. But anything that supports good gut health, maybe a good probiotic. Yeah, uh, I so like that. Fermented food, sauerkraut is a good one. Uh, yeah, but yeah, pretty much anything that can support gut health. Now you probably won't get a doctor to say this, but I'll say it: uh, turmeric. Uh, because and the only reason the doctor might not say it is it's not yet officially recognised by the European Food Standards Agency, EFSA. Uh, there's no, well, we think there's loads of proof out there, but they haven't yet given it the tick. Uh, but turmeric, time and time and time and time again, uh, from personal experience with friends and father-in-law, seems to work quite well. Uh, um, but as of yet, not officially recognised. So maybe turmeric, but look after the gut health. I think that's the, the yeah. The key and and uh, I'm I'm not against turmeric. I think it, it's great. I use it in my cooking, and uh, it's it's a wonderful spice to add in. So there you go. I hope that uh, helps, uh, Carrie. So uh, supplementation, uh, folic acid. Look after the gut um, in, in every way possible that you can. There's lots of advice in in, in Primal Cure about that. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, in the Primal Gourmet book, at the back of the book, uh, what I did a bit different in the index is I've actually done, uh, I've sort of categorised every single recipe by, based on what you might worry about uh, in terms of, of problems. So there's a whole section of different types of food uh, that can help you uh, uh, for arthritis. Right, so hopefully that's a, a great answer for you there, Carrie. Right, next one is from Richard. Now, Richard, I hope we're assuming this abbreviation correctly, <laughs> otherwise you might be complaining at us. Uh, Richard says, I have suffered with my weight for years and ED. We're going to assume right now uh, that ED stands for erectile dysfunction. And if we're wrong, we do apologize. So we're going to cover up this in a second. So I've suffered with my weight for years and ED. Uh, what's the best products to buy to help with both? I also have high blood pressure and asthma and angina. Uh, so I'm not sure uh, which would help without doing any harm to my problems. Thank you in advance, Richard. Now, before you think that Richard is alone by having quite a few different things 
go, you know, going on with his health. Sadly, that is a case today, isn't it? That we're seeing it more is. and more and more that people have got, you know, uh, angina, asthma, uh, weight problems, and uh, and. I, this really opened my eyes with my dad, you know, he's on like five or six different medications and dad's got, he's, he's now diabetic, he's got this problem, that problem, and so on and so forth. And you must see this all the time as a, as a GP, it's like this spiral effect, isn't it? And, mm -hmm. and almost, once you can start solving one problem with your health, then everything else gets a little bit better and a little better and a little bit better. So, uh, Richard, you're not alone. I think there's, is the first thing to say that you've got quite a few things going on here. Uh, I think the best thing we can do for Richard, let's try and maybe do one at a time. Uh, the, believe it or not, Richard, the simplest one, in one sense, in some ways it's really difficult because if you're addicted to sugar and carbs, it is an addiction because of what they put into a lot of these packaged foods. The simplest thing to reduce weight, and, and, and literally every doctor that works with us here will tell you, is find a way to cut out the carbohydrates and the sugar, the sugar and the carbohydrates. That, that's the first step. We get onto exercise later and all these other things. Mm -hmm. But I think we all sing off the same hymn sheet mm -hmm. that the thing that puts on the weight isn't the fats, unless you're eating loads of vegetable fats. But you know, if you're eating whole fats, wholesome food, it's not the protein, it's not the fats, it's anything with carbohydrates or sugar in it too much. So we're not going to go into depth, I don't think. With Richard on the weight because there's so many other questions here and the mm -hmm. weight one we, we sort of cover quite a lot so try and find a way to get off the carbs and it's like giving up smoking it's like giving up drinking it's hard at first but once you do it we were talking about this earlier mm -hmm. you know just we, we were filming this in, in January this one I let go of myself a little bit over Christmas but but actually once you make that decision to cut down those carbs the mm -hmm. weight just we were talking about it we, mm -hmm. 10 minutes ago the weight just falls off yeah right if you can cut the carbs cut the sugar the weight falls off let's go to uh, erectile dysfunction, what's the best product to help with both? Gosh, um, I think... Um, <laughs> Sorry, Doctor. No, that's quite all right. I'm uh, sure that's not the first time you've been asked that as a, as a GP. Uh, no, it's not. And, and also, I, I think it's important to remove the stigma from such situations. Yes. You know, it's an Agreed. increasing problem and it's very treatable. That, that's yep. one of the things that I want to mention. And also to Richard, um, there's a, a number of conditions that, uh, that, that he's described here, which, which I feel, you know, looking at the overall uh, picture that we're seeing, it would ideally need an approach with support from his own primary care physician yep. um, and looking at the best ways to manage such conditions. But I think from a broad point of view, you absolutely agree with you, from a dietary point of view, certainly looking at cleaning up the diet, whole foods, natural foods, um, eliminating um, added sugar, processed foods, low carbs, and, you know, starchy foods, etc. And, and just really sort of cleaning things up can have a tremendous difference. Um, and not only to his health, but also uh, not only to his weight, but also you know his blood pressure. Yep. Um, I think in addition to that, I'd also want to talk to Richard about his stress levels. Mm -hmm. I think that can be a huge element here in terms yep. of contributing to pretty much all of the conditions that he's been diagnosed with, or, yep. or he feels that he has. And uh, looking at ways to de-stress, to relax, to unwind, to detach from you know the day-to-day problems that we're all faced with uh, on a regular basis increasingly um, and I think that would really be a critical part of it but um, in terms yes, of in fact because we, we, we see in all of the things that Rich has mentioned here from mm -hmm. weight to uh, erectile dysfunction to to uh, asthma to angina there's kind of a yeah, stress could play a part in every single one of those. Yes, stress can play a part in all, all of those and many other problems yeah. as well. Um, so I think it's, it's absolutely essential to to have have a look at that and, and see what what can what can be done, what he can do, what you know people around him could potentially do to support um, and manage any stress levels that he's experiencing. But yes, I think the combination of everything he's describing probably needs a sort of one-on-one -on -one approach with, with his primary care physician to get additional support. And from a supplementation point of view, it's very much, I don't think there's a single supplement that would necessarily help here. Mm -hmm. um, it's really, it would be better just to look at what's happening from a dietary aspect and see yep. which particular areas he might be, he might be needing support in. Um, rather than blindly recommending a single supplement over others. Yeah, and that's kind of the whole uh, point of Ask the Doctors, you know, we, we, we kind of stress that there are some things that we can jump in and give you maybe a quick solution and a quick answer that, that you know, will work for nearly everybody, but on specific cases like this where there's four or five things that Richard needs to probably address, then, you know, speak to maybe your GP to mm -hmm. start off with, 
because um, we don't like to make guesses and you should never guess, but you know, it could be that stress plays a part in all of those. It could be, a, you know, it, it could be, and again, there are levels of all these things, aren't there? Mm. So there's levels of blood pressure. Is it just slightly up or is it a lot up? Uh, uh, and angina as well. So, uh, and it could be that just getting your diet right in the, you know, at, at the start with whole foods and cutting down those carbs, especially the sugar, getting the sugar right out uh, and eating whole foods and then trying to look at your stress levels might fix many of those problems. Yes, yes, I, I believe so. Um, Richard, I hope that's helped um, and, and thank you for a very uh, open question. Right, the next one. Um, I am 60 years old, this is from Jeanette. I'm 60 years old and I've just been di diagnosed with MS which uh, I'm thought to have perhaps had a number of years, but I'm only now seeing uh, severe symptoms. What can I do to best look after and improve my health and condition? So it's Jeanette, just been diagnosed with MS. Uh, she's now seeing severe symptoms. What's the best thing she can do to look after and improve her condition? Okay, well, I mean, that's a terrific question. Um, MS is a complex, medical condition that is not really fully understood in terms of how it arises and in terms of the treatments that we get many of the treatments only just sort of attenuate some of the symptoms rather than actually reversing them mm -hmm. um, but it's very timely that Jeanette's asked this question because I recently met a gentleman who really was very inspiring and in talking about how he has helped his wife's MS. So the gentleman who I'm going to name, I've got his permission to, uh, he's called John Joyce. Um, now uh, John's wife was diagnosed with severe progressive multiple sclerosis um, and at, uh, at one stage she could no longer use her hands, she, she could no longer cook and she was an excellent chef. So as a result of that she had to teach John how to yeah. cook and he just got really into it and studied it, learned a lot of different principles and particularly started to explore low carb cooking um, and you can probably guess where this is going but uh, as a result of that uh, he feels uh, just sticking to a really healthy whole food low carb diet that he would freshly prepare for himself and his wife every single day they had such tremendous health benefits his wife's MS now um, she couldn't feel anything from the waist below that has all returned now wow, sensations returned and she can now move her right foot which she couldn't before. And doctors can't explain this. Yeah. I can't explain it. I don't yeah. know how it's worked, <laughs> but uh, it, it doesn't really matter. You know, the association's there since they've changed the way they've eaten. Six months later, her symptoms are so much better, uh, which is just remarkable. And, and um, you know, in addition to that, we talk about knock-on effects of taking positive um, health changes and making good decisions about our health. They both lost three stone each. Uh, she reversed her high blood pressure and he's reversed his pre-diabetes. So I think if there's one bit of advice I'd give around it, it would really be looking at what one is eating, yep. looking at um, healthy foods, whole foods, low carb options, and making sure that our body is getting the nutrients that it needs. I'm going to uh, give you one of my stories now. So uh, last year I walked from uh, Teen to Chamonix with Richard Branson and a group of people and uh, most of them are business people and we, we, we do this every, every year. We do a big challenge, raise money for charity. Mm -hmm. But there's a lovely young man called Dan and uh, Dan wasn't an entrepreneur or a businessman uh, but he worked in a call centre and they ran this competition the call centre to go on this trip with Richard Branson it was a, a, on a Virgin, I can't remember which part of Virgin Empire but it was one of their call centres and Dan won this based on his own transformation Dan had got MS, still has MS but he's, uh, and, and as we know there are different sort of mm -hmm. variants and strands and facets of MS but one of his was seizures and he was starting to get them more and more frequent mm -hmm. and somebody said try and lose some weight so Dan went on quite a severe diet, lost loads and loads of weight. And the, shit, the clip I'm about to show you now is Dan walking from teen to Chamonix, something that only six months before he, he wouldn't have even dreamed of being able to do, walking mm -hmm. up and down mountains. And he puts it down, he's still had, he's had one seizure since he lost his weight, so it's not mm -hmm. gone away completely. Mm -hmm. But massively reducing his weight has made a whole difference to Dan's life. But just before I show you the, the clip then, uh, Jeanette, you know, there isn't one answer, but there is hope. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever been cured of MS, but what we're saying is symptoms can be reduced 
maybe by getting the weight down, but also, again, it's one of those things you've got to go and see your GP about because it's, yes. you know, it, it's, it's quite, it can be very, very severe. Um, but there is hope and it can get better. And, and here's Dan to tell you his story. This young man behind me is nothing but a mere miracle on legs. He has walked uh, up and down for five days, mountain after mountain, from Teen all the way to Chamonix, and we're on our final descent, and there have been some pretty fully abled bodies that have had to drop out for one reason or another, but this young man has survived on and on and on. And Dan is gonna tell you a bit about his story as we descend down this pretty steep mountain. Dan, tell a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so myself, I'm from Newcastle. It's working in a normal call centre of Virgin Media there. Here was Strive, the one inspiring story. Myself, four and a half years ago, I was diagnosed at MS. My daughter was four weeks old. I was knackered, fatigued, tired. I just thought it was because I was a new father. It wasn't, it was my first relapse at MS. Took some time out, got to know my daughter. And then two years ago, I raised two and a half thousand pounds from my local MS society. And then about, again, two years ago or so, at the time I was 23 stone, on a beach with my daughter, she ran away. I chased after her once, she ran away again, and I was like, we can't keep doing this, I can't keep catching it, I can't chase you, I'm not fit enough. And that's when I really need to do something. So, I lost seven stone nine months. I've stopped taking a lot of painkillers now. And all of me, I'll need them one day. I don't want to build up a tolerance, I don't want to be rattling, I don't want side effects. I just want to show my daughter that backgrounds don't matter, disability doesn't matter, you just got to play your hand. My cards are, I've got disability, but it shouldn't bother us. Just get out there, try a bit harder, just do what you can do. Now I love the next question from Helen because it's a preventative question. Uh, I always love preventative questions because I think if we can get the whole country thinking more preventative, mm -hmm. then the NHS can solve a lot of its problems. And yeah. the good news at the moment, it seems like the NHS are starting to listen a little bit and rather than just fixing problems, how do we get the country more healthy? So mm -hmm. Helen's question is, my grandma has glycoma and have I pronounced that correctly? Yeah, that's right. right. Good. Uh, my grandma has glycoma and both my parents have type 1 diabetes, suffering problems with their vision. I'm 30 and on the whole fit and healthy with neither of these conditions, but understandably conscious about eye health. What can I do to look after them and, and lower my chances of problems, says Helen. So Helen's a 30-year-old doesn't have any problems with, she's not type 1 diabetic, she hasn't got any problems with her eyes yet, but understandably with grandma with an eye problem, that's about all I know about glaucoma, uh, which you're going to tell me a bit more hopefully, um, and both have type 1 diabetic, uh, both parents type 1 diabetic, suffering problems with their vision, what can Helen do to better her chances of not getting any problems with their eyes or are, are becoming diabetic type 1? Okay, great question Helen. Um, so glaucoma is when the pressure, the intraocular pressure is increased, meaning the actual pressure of the liquid, the fluid within our eyeballs itself. Um, and what that can do sometimes if it's increased too much, it can cause some pressure on the optic nerve, which can ultimately sometimes cause visual problems. Um, so it's a treatable condition, um, and many cases are managed quite successfully with, with eye drops to, to lower the, the pressure. And it's something that is actually detected by our optician. You know when you go and have your yep. eye test and they, they blow that little puff of air into your eye? Mm -hmm. um, which is always feels a very strange yes, sensation. Yeah. Um, but they're actually measuring what the pressure is, is like and getting an okay. idea as to what's going on there. And that's how they can detect it. So the first bit of advice that I would give Helen would be to maintain regular optician uh, checkups and follow-ups, mm -hmm. uh, particularly with a family history of, uh, of type 2 diabetes and, and glaucoma. Type 1, sorry. Oh, sorry, type 1 diabetes, yeah. beg your pardon, yeah. and glaucoma. Yeah. Because uh, type 1 diabetics, they are at risk of potentially uh, having uh, maculopathies or retinopathies within the eyes, um, and uh, they're often screened to make sure that they're not getting any um, progress in those mm -hmm. areas. So I think it's just as important that, that Helen has that sort of annual eye test to, to screen for things. We can pick up a lot of things in the very early stages through some simple tests, through the optician, to detect such conditions which can be treated easily. In terms of what she can do to prevent uh, or support her eye health, um, 
there were very just different um, supplements, um, but it's not really clear how much they really do. Mm -hmm. However, uh, it's known that things like zinc and selenium and vitamin A, C and E, they all play important roles in eye health. So do make sure that getting good amounts of that through the diet uh, to, to support our overall health. That's great advice. So Helen, uh, yeah, again, <laughs> eat healthily, believe it or not, it does happen. Yeah. Uh, people laugh when I say that carrots actually do help your eyesight, mm -hmm. but some of the compounds uh, inside carrots, two in particular, one beginning with an X, I can never pronounce it, so I'll make myself look silly, um, uh, and uh, lutein. There are two compounds in carrots that are associated with good eye health. So uh, again, uh, maybe a good thing to get would be the Primacure cookbook, where in the back I list all the different food ingredients that relate to, you know, sort of known, associated with good eyesight. But I want to take this in a slightly different direction, Helen. And the first thing is, with both your parents being diabetic type 1, first of all, that's really unusual um, to have both. It's not so unusual to have two parents that have got diabetes type 2, because you know, diabetes type 2 normally is to do with um, uh, overweight, in, in activity, and mm. so on and so forth. So I've seen quite a lot of people that have got two parents that are diabetic type two, but diabetic type one, uh, which is nothing really to do with diet per se or exercise. Um, it, it normally, well, it can be immune system, can be other things, and so on and so forth. Mm. My thinking though is that if the that if she's 30 years old already, there's a. I mean, you can, I guess, I shouldn't be. I should be asking you a question rather than setting you up here, but um, <laughs> normally type 1, you know about it quite early on, don't you? Normally? Yes, normally we would uh, detect that a bit earlier yeah. before the age of 30. Yeah. However, if uh, Helen does have any concerns, I would nonetheless recommend getting getting tested for it through a GP. It's a very straightforward blood test. So to so get a test for it, uh, uh, Helen, if you're worried about it, but the likelihood is if you're 30, there's a good chance that, that, that you pass that age where you'd probably be diagnosed with it anyway. Don't worry about it as much. And, and, and I want to take this on a slightly different uh, uh, angle because I wrote about it in, in, in both of the books and that is that so many people and there are a few diseases and conditions where uh, you are more likely to inherit what your parents have got but overall with most conditions where uh, for example cancers are, uh, and again there are some cancers that are mm. that, that do run in families but most cancers, just because your parents have had it, doesn't necessarily mean that, that, that you're going to inherit mm. it. And, and a lot of people I talk to, I had it described to me once this way, and I wrote about it in the book, that, okay, let's say that your parents have had a certain type of cancer, uh, and the way it's described to me, and I describe it in my book, is that it's almost kind of like the gun might be loaded a little bit more, but something still has to pull the trigger. So if you mm -hmm. eat healthily, if you, you know, eat the right things, if you get some exercise, you go and walk as much as you can, most things, with us, so my, my dad's diabetic type uh, 2, my mum's early Alzheimer's, you know, I'm not particularly worried about either of those, even though uh, type 2 is a different thing, but certainly uh, Alzheimer's can be hereditary, mm -hmm. but a lot less than people think that mm -hmm. there is. It's, you know, there's so many things you can do. Just try and stay healthy, try and get the exercise, try and walk more, eat the right things. And if you're at the age 30 already, and the regular eye t uh, test, as Dr. Shan has said, then I, you know, I think you're going to be all right. Yeah. Um, so hopefully that, that 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 answers that one. Anything to add on on that one? Or? Uh, no, I think I think you've pretty much covered it, and and you're absolutely right. Um, I, I agree in terms of uh, looking at um, type two. Uh, sorry, type 1 diabetes, uh, chances are she would have probably been diagnosed by now. Uh, it would have been picked up one way or another. Um, and uh, as she's reached the age of 30 and she's okay, I would uh, recommend just uh, keeping uh, regular checks on her overall health. Excellent. Thank you very much. Right, the next question we have uh, is from Bridget. I have a bunion on my large toe that becomes painful and swollen especially when I wear high heels. Don't wear high heels, uh, is the first thing I'll say, Bridget. Uh, I'll come to, to that in a second. I, I, I shouldn't uh, make light of any question, but I'll, I'll explain why I say that in a moment. Uh, what causes this and how can I fix it? 
So a bunion on my large toe that becomes painful especially and swollen, especially when wearing high heels. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, uh, first of all, I want to be certain that it is indeed a bunion, um, because sometimes gout can Im mimic it. Um, but bunions usually arise as a result from what we call overpronation of the big toe, yep. where if you imagine that's the foot, it yep. kind of like seems to pronate that way. And oftentimes it's a result of being used to walking in a certain way um, and obviously footwear can play a, play a particular role and as a result of that if, that, if that is sort of chronically happening it does cause that uh, what we call the metatarsophalangeal joint to become um, displaced mm -hmm. and it can start to stick out a little bit and can be very painful, very uh, sore and tender. In terms of preventing it, um, obviously footwear is a key thing, comfortable footwear, insoles, um, cushioned uh, shoes and uh, probably if you feel you have a concern about your gait, about the way you walk, then perhaps taking advice from, from a podiatrist um, mm -hmm. or a foot doctor to look at uh, what's happening in terms of, of how you're walking and maybe take some advice and support around that. Yeah, and I completely support what you're saying there because, and this is from personal experience, and my uh, eldest son has had two knee operations, I've had one knee operation, mm -hmm. and Sadly, we did the damage to our knees um, mainly because we didn't seek advice in the first place and, 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 and that was all down to the way we walked, but my son the same, uh, we, we walked a certain way, our stance wasn't right mm -hmm. and, and normally a little bit of corrective uh, action can make a huge difference mm -hmm. on, on all sorts of things. So, mm -hmm. you know, my my uh, 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 personal trainer, who's very well educated on, on parts of the body, says that actually normally the knees can't that really go that wrong. It tends to be something to do with the hip normally, or the ankle, or mm -hmm. there's something else causing you to walk a certain way, and that's how my knee went out. So you're absolutely right, is, is, is maybe uh, have a look at your foot when, but get some advice, get some specialists to look at your stance. There's all sorts of clever computers they can use now that yeah. you walk along and they can work out what pressure you're putting on each foot. They can work out you know, how your stance is different. And there can be some corrective things just about sort of helping you realize that you walk a certain way mm -hmm. or like say footwear, you might mm -hmm. have uh, certain things that you need to change inside one shoe or the other. But back to that flippant comment I made at the beginning, and it wasn't really <laughs> flippant, and that is about footwear, uh, and, and you know, the best thing you can do for, for, for your back, for your bones and all sorts, is try and walk on as flat shoes as possible, as often as possible. Now I'm not saying any lady isn't going to have a pair of high heel shoes at all, because also being confident and happy with the way you look is important, so there are times when you want high heels to, to look the part. But when it's not that important, let's just say you're walking around at work or at home and you're with your close friends, whatever, the flatter you can keep your feet, the better. I say flat feet, straight back. And, and the reason I say that is back to primal. You know, we, we're not designed to walk around in high heel shoes with our feet at that angle. The body isn't designed to do that. And therefore, when you ever you can, get those flattest shoes as possible, or bare feet, I mean, trying to be in bare feet as much as possible, and straighten out those feet. And I was saying to somebody the other day, uh, it was really, really interesting, is, uh, as you know, I've got seven kids, uh, my little one's three years old, and I mm. said to my wife, I'm monitoring so much, because he still sits with his back completely straight as a three-year-old, completely okay. straight back, and yet my 10-year-old's starting to lean over a bit, and, you know, we, as we get older, we have to make a conscious effort to sit mm. up straight, and it must be, Considering we all sit down way more than we designed to sit down, uh, you know, there's loads of studies and research that say the more you can stand up, the more you can walk, the healthier you are, and so on and so forth. The fact that we sit down so much, we're just not very good at it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so try and sit straight back, but when it comes to your feet, the less time you can wear in high heels, and that's not just ladies, and you know, a lot of men, we have these you know, one inches at the back, I'm quite sure, uh, and you know, sometimes if I want to get confident, I'll put high heels on, but as much as possible, mm -hmm. flat feet. Flat feet, flat feet, for so many different reasons. So I have a bunion on my large toe. Great answer for Dr. Shan, especially when I'm wearing high heels. My thing is try not to wear the high heels as much. Um, and, uh, and and maybe look at, you know, uh, getting some advice about the way you stand or the way you walk or, or, or the arches of your feet and all sorts. Uh, anything else? Um, no, I mean, there, for severe bunions, obviously there is the option of corrective surgery, but we want to avoid that wherever possible. So yeah. trying to look at and exhaust real, really sort of, you know, the, the causes and prevent the um, progression of it through the measures we've talked about is really the key thing. Isn't this, again, one of those things that we talk about quite a lot, which is, you know, as GPs, you, you have 
so many people coming in these days um, because you know, we, we, we are not an overall a healthy nation. But something you say, and Dr. Dan says, is that with certain things, people should come and see you. So things like this, mm. some people might be saying, oh, it's only a bunion, maybe I, I don't need to go and get advice, I'll just live with it, I'll cope with it. But actually, those are the sort of things, actually you do want to see people about and give some advice, because you can correct it early on before that becomes a severe problem. Mm. So does that make sense? Is that I, I don't want anyone to suffer in silence with yeah. any symptom that they're concerned about. I know that you know there's, the NHS is under a lot of strain, a lot of pressure, and uh, there's a general sort of uh, approach nationally to try and reduce the strain and you know not see a doctor unless you absolutely really need to. Um, and and I, I can understand that side of things, but at the same time, I don't want people suffering in silence. If there is a problem that someone is experiencing or a concern about their health, it's really important that they have access to appropriate people that can help or advise and support them. That's great, Dr. Dunn. Thank you very much. Right. Let's go to Judy. Uh, Judy, I am a big believer, as you are at Primal, in the importance of sleep. Uh, I'm 35, use monitoring apps, sleep in a dark room, and overall get a decent night's sleep. But no matter how many hours I get, or how good it seems to be, I always have dark circles around my eyes. What else uh, could this be down to, and what can I do? It's an interesting one. So she's sleeping a lot. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about the app in a second as well. Uh, I'm 35 years, use an app, sleep in the dark, and overall get a decent night's sleep, overall get a decent night's sleep. Mm -hmm. I suppose we still need to say how many hours is that. But no matter how many hours I get, or how good it seems, I always have dark circles around my eyes. Okay, um, that is an interesting question, um, and uh, I, th I think it, it does come back to the common themes that we talked about today, which were firstly diet and secondly stress. But I'd also like to talk and, and ask her about um, what, uh, really sort of understanding and defining what um, uh, she's referring to when she's talking about sleep. You know, what's the quality of sleep? What's mm -hmm. the depth of the sleep? How refreshing is the sleep? How many hours is she getting? And how does she feel on waking? Um, and once we get a, a better picture of that, we can really get a better analysis of it. Uh, uh, I'm always a little bit sort of mistrusting of these various different devices and apps uh, that claim to, you know, monitor different levels of uh, how we sleep. I'd much rather go on how we feel in ourselves. Um, you know, do, do I feel refreshed and ready for the next day, or you know, do I have dark circles around the eyes? Sometimes dark circles around the eyes aren't always related to sleep. You know, I think it's important that, that um, uh, Judy does look at dietary elements and what's happening there, particularly around uh, hydration, vitamins and mm -hmm. minerals, and making sure that, um, that she's getting a, a good amounts of all three of those. And stress levels would be a big part. I mean, obviously, when, when, whenever we meet someone who has dark, dark circles around the eyes, we, we kind of start to think to ourselves, how are they sleeping? Or they look, might look a bit stressed. Um, so, you know, getting a better picture of what could be happening from a stress point of view and how that could be tackled and addressed. Yeah, and I'm going to pick up on the app just like you did, the Dr. Shan. You know, I used to use one of those apps, side of the pillow, it tells you what cycle you're in and, the only, uh, and how well you slept, it tells you all these things. The only problem is we still don't know what harm electromagnetic forces do. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I don't let my kids put their mobile phones up to their ears. I don't do that. You know, we, we, we hold on speaker or, or a little earphone going down to the phone because the further that phone away is from your head. So you're sleeping all night with something that might be doing your harm. There's the first thing. And the only benefit possibly some of these apps that help you wake up when you're in the right cycle. But I'm totally with you 100% that sleep your body, you will know when you've had a good mm. night's sleep. Mm. And, and, and maybe not every time you'll know exactly, but you tend to feel when you wake up that you kind of know you've had enough. And mm. it's very difficult if you work, it's very difficult if you've got children, and there are times in our life when you just can't get a, a enough sleep. Mm -hmm. and, and then don't also stress about that because that makes matters even worse. But if you're in a position where you can get a good night's sleep, let's say it's a weekend, maybe you haven't got kids or the kids are grown up, Listen to your body, that's mm. the first thing, isn't it? Listen to your body. But also, if you haven't got big black lines, uh, exactly as Dr. Chan says, it could be stress, could be a lack of hydration. You know, are you drinking enough water? 
Uh, are you hydrated? It could be a lack of certain vitamins, um, you know, a multivitamin, a vitamin C. Uh, it could be it could be deficient in zinc. Could be magnesium. Could be could be so many different things. It could be the diet. Um, uh, so uh, not really help. Lots and lots and lots. But don't. I, I think the, I think probably one of the things we can care on is that. Dark circles under the eyes might not just be about sleep. Mm. It, it, could, you know, it could be other things. And my advice to everybody is don't sleep with a mobile phone by the side of the head. Not only that, it's another gadget that might bleep. It's another thing that might interrupt a good night's mm. sleep. You know, in, in my house, we try and make sure after a certain time at night, the gadgets are as far away from the bedroom as possible. Mm. <laughs> you know, the last thing you want to be doing is looking at phones and texting and emailing and Facebooking right up to the moment you go to bed. You need to mm -hmm. de-stress, you need to de-wine uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, not a big fan of the apps um, and I think we're saying it could be down to to various different things. Various different things. I'm not sure how helpful we've been here, but uh, <laughs> I think to what, what I would broadly say to look at is is, is really exploring the sleep um, yeah. in terms of, of how how enriching, how refreshing it is. Yeah. Really exploring the diet and exploring the stress levels. They'd be the key things yeah. to to look out there. And, and uh, I think the answer um, to um, Julie's problems is somewhere in there. Yeah, and the sleep is important, isn't it? Because mm. you know uh, the the uh, uh, skin regenerates eight times faster when we're asleep than when we're awake. So that, you know, that is always the, I mean, Judy has started by saying, you know, is it, is it around sleep? And that is probably the first place to look, but then also don't roll, roll out stress, also don't roll out um, you know, uh, hydration and good nutrition. So mm -hmm. uh, hopefully we've helped a little bit of that, Judy. And again, you know, it's, that's the, as the doctor is great, but a lot of these things, that's why you do have GPs and we do have... Is this something you could go to the pharmacy and talk about, or is it really a, a GP type? Could you, you know, if you've got... If you think you're having a good night's sleep, and you're sure it's not sleep, is that something that a pharmacy could help, or is this pretty much a GP type question? Once you, once you know you're getting enough sleep... I, read, I remember reading your book, and... Uh, I remember in your book, and you, you had a lady come in and said, she said, I'm always tired. And you said to her, how much sleep do you get? And normally the answer is not enough sleep if mm. you're tired and fatigued. Mm -hmm. and I thought that was quite an interesting one. So uh, is that something that a, a pharmacy can help with, or is that really a GP thing once you've got your sleep back on track? Um, I think... Um Probably both, really. It, it depends on on um, on how it's affecting the individual. Yeah. If, if it's not having a dramatic impact on on a quality of life, um, I'd probably start with pharmacy, uh, a pharmacist, and yeah. just see what, what advice or guidance they can give. And, and I'll tell you what I'd also say to Judy. Here's something: we know that she's quite young. She's 35. We know she uses an app, which means you're onto technology. First thing I'd also say as well is do some reading, do some Googling, do, there's a lot of rubbish out there as well, but get some mm. books, find some books just about sleep, and there's a whole section in Primal Cure just about sleep, mm -hmm. because there are certain tricks you can do to help getting a good night's sleep, like mm -hmm. getting the temperature right in the room, mm -hmm. making sure, as she said, it's already a dark room, but it's not just a dark room, there's several things you can do um, to help and aid a good night's sleep. I, I take magnesium before I go to sleep, for example, because. For me personally, that really, really works. Mm. There might be certain things that, 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 that uh, Judy can do, uh, but certainly the fact that you use computers and you're 35, just reading uh, mm. and see if you can get some more advice. Right. And also just to remember that sleep is not just about physical rest, it's about mental rest. And, and I do see a lot of people who have sleep problems um, resulting from the fact that when they're in bed, their mind is just so active and they're just overthinking about so many different things, usually stressful things that are worrying and will inevitably keep them awake. It's important to allow yourself, both physically and mentally, to slowly unwind and relax and create an evening routine that prepares you for sleep. Yeah, and one of the things, uh, I can't remember now whether I touched on it in the Primal Cure book, uh, but certainly something I've learned over the years, is that when I am tossing and turning on those days where things are going through the head, mm. I actually put the light on, but very, very low, just enough so I can read, not that if it's bright, then again, it wakes you up, but mm -hmm. just enough so I can read, I get a pen and paper, I always have a notepad by the side of the bed, and I just write down what it is, because normally you, you wake up in the morning, you go, I spent three hours tossing and turning about that, and now I can't even remember what it uh -huh. was I was tossing and turning about, <laughs> but I remember it was important at the time, so I wake up now, or if I'm awake and I'm tossing and turning, I write down what it is, but don't turn the lights on bright, because again, that, that disturbs your sleep. Mm -hmm. um, 
write down what it is, and I tend to find that helps fall back mm. to sleep. But again, that's another tip. Tips, tips, tips. Re research, I think, what might work for you, Judy, in helping you. And just check that you are getting a good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. If not, maybe look at the other areas we've talked about. Right. Um, and next, we've got from Ellie. Um, I'm confident a friend of mine is showing signs of depression and has been for a number of months now. I'm extremely worried, but don't know how to best approach the situation or speak to her about it. Look, Ellie, you know, this is the first time we've had this question, and I'm surprised it hasn't come up before. Mm. And it's a bloody good question, so yes. let's, let's dive in. So she's got a friend that she thinks is showing signs of depression. Um, and has been for a while, and she's worried. And, and what should she do as a friend to, to help? Should she speak to her? Should she ignore it? Should she? Again, it, this is <laughs> there's so many different variants on this one. It's hard to give advice to this specific one. But let, let's, let's let's have a go. Let's have a go. Yes, uh, it, and you're absolutely right. It is it is a terrific question, and I think you know increasingly we're starting to remove the stigma that has been attached to mental health over the over the last years. Um, and we see this very often. I'm sure everyone has a friend in their lives yeah. who they're thinking, hmm, maybe they, they seem quite low or they're not quite themselves, what's going on? And how do we help? Um, I think the first step to helping in that situation is, is, to, is to just take some time out and, and connect with them without judging. Once we remove um, our um, sometimes innate uh, desire to judge people, uh, it can actually help people open up a lot better, mm -hmm. creating that sort of safe space for them to they, so they can actually feel that they can talk about how they're feeling. There's a whole slogan, isn't it, at the moment? Uh, I can't remember exactly, I think it's sort of like, be in your mate's corner, it's, it's exactly what you say, yeah. so don't judge, it's sit down, get in that corner with them. And, and yeah, um, so ensuring that they feel that they have support and, and backing and they're not feeling judged and then it's much easier to gain their trust and, and offer that appropriate guidance and say, well, look, you know, how are you feeling? How, how are you really feeling? Do you want to talk about it? You can talk to me anytime about anything. You know that, don't you? Um, and, you know, making them feel that they have that network of support. Um, and going and, and offering different ways to help them. You know, I, I would always recommend speaking to a doctor um, in, in the first instance if, if there are some major concerns about clinical depression or possible clinical depression uh, to get some additional advice as well and offer to go with your friend to see the doctor and say, look, you know, you know I'm here for you and obviously I, I'll, I'll come with you if you'd like me to. If you want me to step outside, I'll do that as well. Um, and it's important to, to understand what that individual will be going through. Um, they, they are fearing being judged. They're worried that a doctor is going to throw pills and potions at them. Um, they, you know, they, they may will have a number of concerns about what's happening within their own lives with you know, stress levels, financial problems, whatever they might be. I'm speculating here. But I think it's important to help people understand that they're not alone in such situations. There is support out there. and. It's, a, it's a vital that they look at how they can take that support, really engage mm -hmm. in it, and they're only going to do that if they feel trusted and not judged. Yeah. Um, so it's not an easy thing to do, and it's also important to you know be able to respect someone's personal space mm -hmm. and say you know what, actually I'll do what I can, but I've got to understand that um, I'm not in charge of how they choose to live their lives, um, and that can be. That can be quite challenging in itself. So Ellie's question is quite interesting. What are the so, so she says? I'm confident my friend is showing signs of depression. Let's let's take this in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. Or it might be the perfect way Ellie's asking for the question. What sort of signs are we looking out for to to maybe say that somebody's suffering from depression? Okay, so depression is uh, is defined as a persistent low mood. Um, which often has what we call biological symptoms. And those biological symptoms can be changes in an appetite, changes in weight. So when I say changes, it can go up or down. Changes in sleep patterns, difficulties in concentrating or making decisions. Um, and oftentimes we just notice uh, a different um, Demeanor about them in yeah. terms of, of uh, what we're what we're sensing when we're with them. You know, if mm -hmm. they seem to be more argumentative or irritable, 
or looking on the downside of things and uh, being overtly pessimistic and we kind of get a sense as to something's not quite mm -hmm. right if it's a friend that we've known for a long time. Um, so they're, they're the common things to look out for and many cases, mild to moderate cases of depression can be managed very, very well. There are incredible support services out there uh, in terms of um, counselling, uh, psychotherapy, cognitive behavioural therapy um, and most people for most people that's actually all that is needed. It's about really how uh, they choose to engage with such services and, and taking that support available to them. Yeah, I mean I wrote on the front cover uh, of the second edition of the book, you know, um, that one in four people you know, do suffer uh, from some sort of, and I don't want to use the word mental illness, but it, 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 there are more and more and more people suffering from depression than, than we've... Is it the fact that we're recognising it now as something rather than, oh, you silly thing, uh, what have you got to worry about? Mm. Is it the fact we are now starting to recognise it? Or is it... Uh, you know, let's just assume that over the last 20 years that people's lifestyles are... Um, you know, let's say we're, we're not less stressed. Or more stress. Let's say that it's been on a plateau overall across the country, and maybe it is in different places. I think my point is, if it's more prevalent now than it used to be, could it be diet? Could it be also uh, it, it, could, what what what, start, what what is causing almost an epidemic at the moment of depression? Great question. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no apologies. No, that's fine. Um, I think, uh, and, and, uh, and in my personal opinion, I think it's both. I think it's uh, awareness as well. Increasingly, we are now looking at um, case finding, how we can spot and, and support people. Um, and, and I think it's really important that that is happening because it's been such a widespread problem but hasn't really got the attention that it deserved until the last decade or two. Uh, but at the same time, I think it is, it is stress levels mm -hmm. um, and not just you know, stress that we're experiencing from an environmental aspect, but stress, sometimes a dietary stress. Um, or, or an emotional stress uh, that, that's going on and you know I mean we live in such stressful times right now um, you and I were talking off camera earlier about um, what's happening in London and and how things are just so um, heightened in terms of, of uh, uh, people's sensibilities right now and how fragile pe some people can be in terms of what can trigger them um, that I think this it, it could really well be a, a a part of a part of everything we're talking about and um, so I think looking at how we can manage it what we can do it really comes back to appropriate measures whether it's counseling whether it's therapies but also looking at lifestyle measures mm -hmm. de-stressing relaxing unwinding detaching taking care of ourselves um, removing ourselves from overtly stressful environments and uh, not letting that stress get to us and anything can get to us if we let it you know how many things are out there out there in the world yeah. that are depressing right now yeah one or two um, <laughs> and uh, you know if we really focus on those all the time yeah. Inevitably, we're going to start to feel down, but there's also some incredible things happening um, right now, um, and and I think it's important that we do make sure we're getting uh, uh, absorbing a good balance of that as well. And it, it's interesting that because there's I don't want to put them into just two camps, but I think what happens is you know you can understand if somebody's had a personal tragedy or mm -hmm. just lost their job or a breakup or you know had their house repossessed or something like that. You can almost, well not, not almost, you can completely understand mm. how that can make somebody depressed and so on and so forth. Mm. And, and that can sometimes just fix itself with time because time's mm. a good healer. Mm -hmm. One of the things I'm seeing more and more though, I, I know some very wealthy people that have got great kids, great jobs, great families and almost everything they want and still getting depression and, and the, the kind of they're kind of different things, aren't they? And, mm. and it's trying to, it's probably easier to spot the person that's had a tragedy or something or something just happened that's really awful in their life. It's probably easier to spot that and to understand that. Um, but also don't disregard that friend who is showing that some of those signs that you've talked about, mm. who seems to have everything and has got mm. the good job and the nice family and everything, because depression can come from all sorts of angles, can't it? And I mm. think back to that slogan at the moment, it's, the key mm. thing, I think, mm. back to uh, Ellie's question, it's a friend. And if it's a friend, mm. it's, it's, you've got uh, one mouth and two ears. The mm. key thing is to use them in that, isn't it? It's, it's mm. let them do the talking. Let them know you're on their side. Yeah. And just, um, but also, 
it's so common now. I think I, I had a friend Sandy who committed suicide, and mm. uh, uh, Richard, lovely gentleman, ex world champion at sailing, mm -hmm. committed suicide at 51. He had got two children, uh, Steph and Ben, beautiful children. Steph had got young kids as well, so he was a granddad. Uh, and, and, and his problem was he'd stopped winning at a sport and he just couldn't cope with it. And we tried and we tried and we tried and tried. But if myself and my other friends, I think we just left it too late. Mm -hmm. And because I think in the early days back then, because we're going back a few years now, um, it was, oh, what have you got to moan about? What, why, why are you like this? Why are you doing mm -hmm. that? And it, mm -hmm. we were very, co not condescending is the wrong word, but it was like, stop moaning, Richard. What, you've got all this, you've got that. Da, 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 da. Look at those trophies on your wall from the past. Mm -hmm. And you've got great, you've got grandkids and all that. And if, if there was anything we were guilty of, it was that we were all passionate about him. We loved the guy completely, but mm -hmm. It was that not that understanding. So the key thing I think with Ellie's total understanding, it's quite normal these days. Mm -hmm. Let them do the talk and try and, and just mm. let them know you're there for yeah. them. Encourage them. Well, not encourage them, but uh, you know, en enable them to open up. Yeah. Um, create that. The, open that door for them uh, to make them feel that it's safe and it's okay and, and we're not here to judge. Yeah. We're here to help. We're here to support. And the other thing is. Um, I mean, obviously, judge the circumstances, and you know, if the mood is right, if the time is right, um, actually physically um, make yourself present there. I remember some some years ago, I think probably 20, 25 years ago, um, a friend of mine uh, called me, and, and I was actually particularly down at the time about uh, something that was going on in my personal life, and he sensed it, and uh, and he said, right. I'm coming over right now, and I, I tried to talk him out. I said, "No, no, don't. I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay." And I wasn't, but uh, and and uh, he put the phone down. And then that's typically British, though, well, isn't it? Isn't, he, that, isn't, he, isn't, he that, the, Shan, isn't that part of the problem, though? As, probably, as, yes. as, a, as, a, yes. as a nation, yes. we don't complain in restaurants. I'm fine. Yeah. Your, but here's, your but here's the thing. Um, he actually, I phoned him back to. To make sure he wasn't coming over and he said listen can you hear that that's my car engine I've just slammed the door I'm on my way and we're going out for Chinese food and, and he knew that I love Chinese food and so that was how he opened the door for yeah. me and took care of me and uh, you know I mean who's to know what would happen if, if he hadn't done that for me that particular time but you're right yes it is very true I'm, I'm fine I'm fine that's so English what, what does fine so mean British. yeah I'm yeah. fine no look yeah. leave me alone I'm yeah. absolutely fine whereas yeah. in other countries we're much more open so maybe that maybe that's one of the yeah. maybe we've just got to one of the root problems of why as a nation mm. we, we, we're suffering from more depression than maybe mm. other nations it could be a lot we talked about you know, going on in London and, and problems mm -hmm. with the country but mm -hmm. also we're quite Tight. What's the word? We're quite enclosed, aren't we, as, as human beings in the UK? It's, it's that, it's yeah. that uh, you've got to try and get people to open up and talk. I yeah, think. I yeah. think we, we 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 suppress a lot of what's actually really going on, and I think it's important that we have those channels to to release them. Hopefully, that's helped. Um, you know that 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 is a subject to probably our next book <laughs> together. <laughs> sure, let's do it. Stress <laughs> and and depression. You know, these are things that can lead to all sorts of things, but mm -hmm. also actually there are things that lots of people suffer from stress lots of people suffer from depression but it, back to the spiral that we always keep talking about if you can start to come out of that then everything just gets better and better and better mm. um, right uh food oh, depression food i just had my earpiece with my, my producer it's a good question food wise is there anything you can do um yeah i'm gonna say look I've got the same answer, I'm like a broken record. I've got the same answer, you I think, uh, yeah, uh, sugar can make you depressed. I mean, overweight can make you depressed. Um, sugar has highs and lows. Uh, we call it the carbo coaster uh, because uh, uh, we won't go into it right now, but um, sugar can, uh, can force the body to go through a whole cycle of, of emotions really quickly. Mm -hmm. So it could be food. It's normally a, a much deeper answer, though, than, than, than just getting your food right. But back to Eddie's question, you've got a friend be there for them, uh, hmm. try and get them to open up. Um, I, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling, uh, he's got a, a small company, mm. uh, he said, I'm str struggling to get my team to work properly. And we started to talk through things and in the end I said, the problem with you is that you're not a listening leader, mm. you're a talking leader, you talk at them, talk at them, talk at them, talk at them and you're never going to get the best at your team. Mm. Mm. You gotta be a listening leader, and I think this is the same with friends. You you've gotta be a listening friend. You try and get them to open up, get them to talk, um, and, and and do a thing you can. Mm -hmm. Ellie, I hope that's helped. We've gone on a few tangents, um, but uh, but hopefully we've, we've answered the question on that one. Um, 
One final question. I think that we've had this one before. It's from Brian. Uh, gout. What is it? Do I have it? So painful toes. Uh, is it gout? Oh, we talked about bunions uh, earlier on in today's program. Mm. Uh, what is gout? How do you know if you've got it? What can you do to avoid it, Brian? Great. Um, so gout is, is actually quite common. Um, gout is an accumulation of uh, sodium urate crystals that can occur in any joint. Commonly the base of the big toe, uh, which is the first metatarsophalangeal joint. And when it does crystallize, when it does flare up like that, it presents very painful, hot, red, tender, and difficult to move. Um, and there's a simple test for it, it's a blood test. Uh, for urate levels, if they come back elevated, that is in keeping with gout. In terms of treating it, um, there are different medicines that can treat it, uh, which your doctor will talk about, things like non steroidal anti-inflammatories, colchicine, or even steroids. Um, but in preventing it, very much down to what we've been talking about today, the common theme, uh, <laughs> which is diet, yeah. um, stress, I'd probably add in hydration there as well, yeah. um, to um, really prevent that crystallization from happening in the first place. Um, so yes, I, I would very much look at what can be done around prevention of it, and I think there are some many uh, very good preventative measures. It's, is it quite common? And the only reason I ask is my dad used to, not as bad now as he used to be, but I remember growing up, six years old, on a beach in Devon, in Woolacombe, dad foot up on a, a, like a stall on the beach saying, if you touch my toes, you know, we'll have to pay for. Uh, and agony, my dad doesn't have it as much now as he used to. I don't think he takes any medication for it, although he takes way too much medication for other things. Uh, but it always, everybody I know that's got it seems to be male. Mm -hmm. and, and increasingly, younger people, so my uh, son-in-law, Jake, gets gout. Mm. Uh, I've got one of my TV presenters over on Gemporia, uh, Drew, gets gout. So is, well, I think my question is, it seems to happen to, regardless of age, but tends to be more male um, than female. Um, other than medication, what can we do to cut down the occurrence of it and the likelihood of getting it? So it would be, uh, hydration would be a good one, mm -hmm. and also looking at diet, whole foods, making sure that we're, we're cutting back on the very sort of uh, acidic loads that uh, can come with processed foods and uh, and, and unnatural foods. Uh, they would be the main things. Um, stress levels, again, like I say, yeah. this is a, a common theme that we're noticing today. Um, but we do see a lot of gout around this time of year, actually, particularly as people have overindulged over the, the Christmas and the festive period, um, that gout can flare up. And um, like I say, it, it is very easy to treat, uh, but it's even easier to prevent mm -hmm. just by looking at uh, a few parameters within our diets, within our lifestyles. Would changing the pH level in, in water make any difference? You know, you know, this one of the is, things we said is a water yeah. filter that takes a pH level mm. from you know, just one or two points down from acidic more to alkaline, would that help? This or? is a terrific question. It's something that I've um, looked into and, and uh, looked into all the research around, and I can't find anything conclusive. Mm -hmm. However, it makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. If we were to increase the pH, we would reduce the acidity, but you know, obviously, Remember the first source of anything we eat goes straight to our stomach, uh, yep. stomach, which is full of hydrochloric acid, which yep. is a, a very low pH. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure of the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I did remember reading about the benefits of uh, drinking lemon water, mm -hmm. ironically, which is acidic. I know, that's one of the things that always gets me. It's yeah. acidic, but actually we think can lower the pH, but there, I, there's well, I don't know, but things uh, that we, we, we believe is right and can't explain why. But the broad <laughs> advice I give is, yeah. is hydration. Just yeah. you know, get, get good water, fluid inside you, um, to, to hopefully reduce that crystallization from happening in the first place. Brian, I hope that helps. Um, I know we've uh, touched on uh, gout a few times, uh, but it just seems to be a reoccurring uh, theme. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you uh, to everybody uh, that's joined us today. I hope you enjoyed the program. And keep your questions coming in to Ask the Doctor and you find that on the bottom of uh, the website at primalcure.com. Need to perform better in the gym or increase your energy and physical performance when sprinting? Clinical research has been conducted and approved by the European Union 
that three grams or more of creatine daily increases physical performance in successive bursts of short-term, high-intensity exercise, more commonly known as HIT. Daily creatine consumption in combination with resistance training can also improve muscle strength in adults over the age of 55. You can find creatine in organic animal proteins such as beef, salmon and tuna at around 4.5 to 5 grams per kilogram of meat or fish. However, it's unlikely that you're going to eat that much meat on training days, hence we formulated Primal Creatine. The preference of professional sports people around the world, Primal Creatine is created with your health in mind.